here they're testing a control rod method. To control the rate of the nuclear reaction, rods containing boron are inserted into the reactor core. The boron absorbs neutrons and slows down the fission process. In an emergency, certain of these rods can be dropped into the reactor core to effect an immediate shutdown. In Calder Hall, the reactor must be shut down every time for recharging with new fuel elements. But in a power station, we must refuel without interrupting the operation of the plant. Much of the work on this problem was undertaken by Strawn and Henshaw, who previously had been associated with coal handling equipment. Quite a change to come down to small grabs like this. Their particular problem was to perfect a technique whereby one standpipe on top of the reactor vessel could be used to charge several fuel channels. This is achieved by lowering the fuel element into a tube of which the lower section is hinged. The fuel element may then be positioned above any selected hole. In actual operation, one standpipe serves 34 fuel channels. The top of the standpipe will normally be sealed, the seal being manipulated in such a way that no gas escapes during the charging process. Spent fuel elements are removed by the same device. The fundamental research on fuel elements was the direct concern of Parsons. An efficient fuel can must have a high heat transfer coefficient, which has been achieved in Bradwell by a unique design of the can surface. Final proving tests on these elements were carried out at Nutsford in rigs, operating at full reactor working conditions. To study the consequences of any sudden change in the normal operation of the reactor, Parsons built a reactor simulator. An instrument like this can be of assistance in the design work on the control system. But when it comes to designing the support grid for the reactor core, then there's no substitute for physical tests on a model. Head Wrightson undertake this work on the support grid. They also carry out research on the transfer of heat from gas to steam in the boilers. Clark Chapman are responsible for the steam side of the boilers. They're developing the latest methods of automatic tube welding on this machine. tubes being assembled here for Bradwell have been developed to transfer the heat from the coolant gas with the maximum possible efficiency. Ultrasonic testing techniques are used widely to ensure that none of the welds fail in service. In manufacture of the boiler shells, Head Wrightson use another ultrasonic test device on the raw plate before preparing the edges for welding. Then the plates are rolled to shape and checked for accuracy with a template. The circumference of the boiler shell is pierced by many parallel steam tubes, which call for close control of the drilling operation. The shell is assembled from ring sections on this jig. Already the great size of the finished article is evident. When they're welded up, the joints are x-rayed for any flaws. Transporting a vessel 87 foot long by 19 foot in diameter could be a problem. But Head Wrightson are on the River Tees at Thornaby, and they decided to seal the vessel and float it down to Bradwell by sea. The first of the seaborne boilers was expected at Bradwell in May 1958, and they were pressing on with the preparation of the blower house and the boiler foundation. This economy borer has been developed from oil drilling techniques. It's a speedy way of pile driving, bore a hole and fill up with concrete. 
In the reactor building, the plinth that will support the reactor is nearing completion. This will have to support quite a weight. The reactor shell amounts to a thousand tons. The graphite core, another 2,000 tons. And the fuel charge adds 250 tons, which makes a total of over 3,000. Wesso of Darlington are the company producing the reactor shell. And they have installed a new press to turn out the curved plates that will form the sphere. The press has a capacity of 4,500 tons, which is adequate for forming the 3-inch to 4-inch thick plates required on Bradford. There is, however, ample margin for handling thicker plates, which may be required in the future. After they are formed, the plates are marked out for cutting by a shadow projection system. The cutting flame is carried on the end of an arm of the same radius as the finished vessel. The finished plates will then be welded together on site. It will be possible to carry the work to an advanced stage under reasonable conditions away from the building area because the Goliath, with its 200-ton lift, can swing the complete rings, which make up the reactor vessel, into their final position. This crane is now a landmark. As the assembly has gone forward, the cranes that have been used to build it have been dwarfed by its size. over the site area. 150 feet high, with a span of 167 feet, it can travel 550 feet from end to end of the reactor building. The frame of the turbine house is dwarfed beside the Goliath, this being the first of the buildings to take shape above ground level. This girder work is carried out by the last of the NPPC's member companies, Alexander Finlay of Motherwell. They have developed these box section girders in connection with their work in conventional stations. On this machine, the four longitudinal welds can be carried out in two passes of the carriage. This gives a very even weld over the whole length. Back on site, the Spider-Men perform their usual circus tricks as a cross member is swung into place. turbine house will eventually accommodate nine turbo generators, six machines providing London with power through the national grid, and three smaller units to drive the gas circulators. Nuclear energy is no longer a dream for the future. It is here with us today. From the heart of these reactor buildings that are rising above the countryside of Essex will come a new force, energy from the atom. Out of the years of research and design work, has come the practical engineering fact, that is, Bradwell. The research will go on, and new designs will come forward, drawing all the time on the experience they are now gaining. We have come a long way, in a short time, since the days when the future of Britain rested on coal. Today, the nuclear power plant company is helping to build a new future. A nation's development can be gauged 
by the power it can place in the hands of its people. Abundant, cheap power from stations such as Bradwell will give us the key to the future. For without power, there will be no future.